gothic fantasy, medieval romance, temples of astrology, oriental exotica, fairy tale castles, all made real. Their creator was one of the most extraordinary men of the Victorian age, a blue-blooded aristocrat who supported women's rights and striking minors, an intellectual who was a ghost hunter and a Welsh-speaking Scottish nationalist. But above all, John Patrick Crichton Stewart, third Marquess of Butte, was a fabulously rich and visionary creator of great architecture. And Butte is a huge amount of input into his buildings, pushing his architects to get something more exceptional. He has a strong sense of colour, of fun, of excitement and of extravagance, and that is what makes his buildings remarkable. The decoration at Mount Stuart, at Castell Cork and here at Cardiff Castle speaks more powerfully of the personality of the man than so many other historic houses you'll ever go to. It was in the Celtic cousins of Wales and Scotland where Bute made his dreams come true. His passions and interests were as wide as his purse was deep. Much of the money in that purse flowed in from the great city that the Bute family created. It was the largest financial establishment outside the square mile in London. They made Cardiff. Cardiff would be an insignificant village without their inspiration. He was certainly one of the richest men in the world. And um, I always say he's the richest man in Victoria's empire. The Isle of Butte in the River Clyde estuary. Less than two hours from Glasgow, it has long been a popular resort. But for 600 years, it has also been the ancestral home of one of the wealthiest aristocratic families in Britain, the Earls and Marquesses of Butte. For centuries, this was their stronghold. Related to the Scottish crown, the Buttes are of the bloodline of King Robert the Bruce and the Stuart dynasty. The third Marquess of Butte, John Patrick Crichton Stuart, was born on the island that shares his name in September 1847. But the infant heir to the Scottish estate was also heir to a massive Welsh fortune that had been inherited and vastly enriched by his tycoon father, the second Marquis. Well, behind me here is a dynamic portrait of John, second Marquis of Butte by Sir Henry Rayburn, the great Scottish portrait painter. And it captures the dynamism of the man who made the family fortune, the great industrialist, the man that really forges modern Cardiff. But flanking the second Marquis are not his parents, but his grandparents, the first Marquis of Butte himself, who marries the rich, ugly Charlotte Jane Windsor, the heiress of those Glamorgan estates. And this is how the Scottish family um, starts to get incredible wealth through their inherited um, estates in South Wales. So this is the beginning of the great family fortune. The secret of the Butte family's immense wealth lay in the alchemy of turning Welsh coal into gold. The second Marquis of Butte knew if he could export coal effectively from his estates in Glamorganshire, he could turn Cardiff into, well, his phrase was, the, the, the new Liverpool or the second Liverpool. And that was his ambition. The great advantage that we had here at Cardiff was that we had a, a wealthy landowner whose um, credit was good, so he could borrow money, no problem, and he owned the land and he could say, look, there will be a dock here to service the industries that are developing on my land north of here. Very, very different, for instance, from the situation in Swansea, where you had the Swansea Harbour trustees who sat around, waffled a lot, had very good dinners and did nothing for decades. Here, one man could make it happen. 
The first dock was built in 1839. The wealth it generated began to turn tiny, insignificant Cardiff into a major city. That first dock now lies under a dual carriageway, close to Cardiff's iconic Wales Millennium Centre. But once from here poured the high-quality, hot-burning Welsh steam coal that would fuel Britain's great naval and merchant fleets. South Wales steam coal turned out to be the perfect coal for the 19th century. And so in 1851, the Royal Navy gives its seal of approval to South Wales steam coal as the only coal that it will use because the other great advantage of coal, of course, is that it is smokeless. So there was a definite tactical advantage um, in having the South Wales steam coal. And as steam propulsion powered the 19th century, so there was a demand for this coal throughout the world. And the price of that coal worldwide was decided here in Cardiff in the coal exchange every day. And it is an organization comparable to what OPEC is today. It's, it's, it was the organization that controlled what was the world's most important fuel source at that time. It is said that the first ever million pound cheque was signed in this building. What the docks created was a huge pathway through which things flowed. And these flowing of goods, iron and coal mainly, that moved through Cardiff, they were what created the money. So the bulk of the Butte money that was actually created as wealth came from things like leaseholds. They would sell the leasehold on a block of land. People would build on that and develop that land because they needed houses for the workers. So it, the money doesn't come directly from the docks. The money comes from the spin-off, from the whole financial operation that is going on down there. The dynamic second Marquis did not reap the rewards of his vision and investment. Just five months after the birth of his only son, he died suddenly of heart disease. The infant inherited the lot, the huge South Wales estate, much of the boom town of Cardiff and the ancient ancestral lands on the Isle of Bute. The child was unexpected, the product of his 54-year-old father's second marriage. The birth was a severe disappointment to his father's brother, who thought he would inherit both title and fortune. His uncle had enough bad taste to publicly hope that the child would die. Now, this was rather sort of off-putting, um, for Butte's mother, and it didn't do much to make Butte love his uncle, as you can imagine. The infant third Marquis's mother, Lady Sophia, consoled herself by raising and educating her son herself. From the start, young Butte was surrounded by his mother's strong and intelligent women friends. I think the portrait shows how very close Butte and his mother were. She poured herself, heart and soul, into the education of her son. She taught him, she was his tutor. And inevitably, he absorbed a huge belief in the value of women, in their intelligence. He grew up believing that women were courageous and honest and worthy of every possible respect. And very, very close to her so that when she died, when he was 12 years old, he was absolutely devastated and, of course, left completely alone in the world. Blighted by grief, the next six years of Butte's life were further marred by quarrels among his guardians as to where and how he should be brought up and educated. And he then passed into the hands of a particularly nasty guardian, um, a Victorian Major General of the old school. Even conservative Victorian friends, men even, disapproved of the way he treated Butte. And so Butte had a very, very rocky adolescence indeed. 
that picture, which was painted at the end of his mother's life, really is his last moment of true happiness until he came of age. At 14, Bute went to Harrow. He would later write that he loathed it, but worked hard and showed an aptitude for languages. Holidays were spent traveling abroad, soaking up ideas and influences. What Bute saw in Greece, Constantinople, and the Holy Land would one day be reflected in the buildings he would commission and partly design. Bute went to Oxford, and when he was 18, met the eccentric architect, William Burgess. The two men shared a passion for medieval art and design. Here, Burgess is painted as a medieval architect. Well, Burgess was an odd-looking person. He was very short, rather rotund, extremely short-sighted. I think we'd think of him as an oddball these days, and certainly the Victorian establishment thought of him as rather odd. But there was something essentially lovable about Burgess. Bute was young, shy, and pious. He could hardly have been more different from Burgess, who was nearly 20 years older, bohemian, eccentric, grumpy, and sociable. In this photograph, he's dressed as a court jester. At 21, amid celebrations in Wales and on the Isle of Bute, the young aristocrat came into his immense fortune. The Bute estate once had to respond to a newspaper article in, in the 1860s about how rich is Lord Bute. Is he worth £300,000 a year, which is what the press was saying. And their reaction was to say, no, he's not. He's worth about half of that. Um, so I'm quite happy to think his income was probably over £150,000 a year. In today's terms, the 21-year-old Bute was worth more than £15 million a year. He was very rich. He didn't have to bother with the mundanity of life. He went through life with a red carpet rolled out in front of him with people saying, my lord, how lovely to see you. Do come in, my lord. Can we get you anything? He never had to think about where his dinner was coming from, where his wine cellar was coming from. That was entirely done for him. He could focus on reading, on walking, and on talking to the people who were building his buildings. The young Marquis left the business of making money to trustees. His main interest was in spending it. His architect, William Burgess, was a genius, but an expensive one. Meeting Lord Bute was absolutely meeting the dream client because Bute had the money, Burgess had the talent, and the combination of the two resulted in some of the most extraordinary buildings of the 19th century. Both Bute and Burgess witnessed the building of the new Palace of Westminster. Its architects, Barry and Pugin, designed it in the Gothic Revival style, which was all the rage among the Victorian elite. Bute would make the style his own. He began by building a tower at Cardiff Castle. Well, of course, when the family first got their hands on Cardiff in the 1760s, it didn't look anything like the building that you see today, it would have been much, much plainer, much smaller, but actually ancient. I mean, the castle is a Roman fort, a Norman Motten Bailey castle, and the centre of the house is actually a late medieval mansion from the 1430s. Black gold from Wales was putting real gold on the ceilings of Lord Bute's houses in Scotland and, and here in South Wales. This was an escape from the industrial world, and it's quite extraordinary to think you've got this Welsh Victorian Camelot appearing in the middle of this new Chicago, as it was called, this fast expanding Welsh town. But he was turning his back on that. Bute shared with Burgess a fascination with astrology, and the pair decorated Cardiff Castle's clock tower 
with astrology's magical symbols. When you look at the outside of the clock tower, you can see those extraordinary statues in bright colors. Well, those are personifications of the planets. Butte was obsessed with astrology and astronomy. I think the people of Cardiff were a bit puzzled by it. Gilding, gold leaf for goodness sake, people didn't like it, not the usual sort of decoration. So people thought it would be quite useful to tell the time. But apart from that, no, it wasn't popular. It's, it's too in your face, I think. Astrology also dominated the interior of the tower. All around the tile decoration, we've got the legends of the zodiac. Up in the dome, we have the stars and the constellations. So it's, it's astrological thought and it's deeply personal to Butte. It's all of his interests and those of William Burgess because it's William Burgess who interested him in astrology. And of course, if you are very, very rich, you need not one, but two smoking rooms. One for the summer and one for the winter. We're in the summer smoking room. It's much lighter, it's double height. And it was a sort of Victorian idea that it's a retreat for gentlemen to sit, to drink and to smoke. Well, it wasn't always actually tobacco that they smoked. Both Butte and Burgess um, smoked with either drug tobacco or uh, with indeed um, opium. When Butte was 18, he'd written in his diary, while on a visit to Greece... We went back to the divan and commenced a grand smoke, which lasted several hours. It was carried on with chill books, filled with the strongest and most delicate drugged Turkish tobacco, fresh pipes being brought in continuously as soon as the old ones were one-third smoked. There's a, an, an entry in Burgess's diary that says too much opium last night could not attend Miss Hayward's wedding. And this wasn't unusual for thinking intellectual Victorians, but it does give the room a sort of hallucinogenic quality. And behind me, you've got these extraordinary, um, well, they're capitals of a column, but they're not like normal capitals. They're actually figures, nearly life-size, clambering out of them. Um, and they are the winds, they are, pairs of the eight winds of classical antiquity. These are the north winds, and they're blowing from the north of the building. So mixed in with this sort of exoticism, you've got an awful lot of thought. I think Burgess and Butte, in the creation of this tower particularly, almost set each other off. I always think that, in a way, the barrel was loaded by Lord Butte and the gun was fired by William Burgess, and this is the resulting explosion. Far from the fantasy being created in Cardiff, the family home on the Scottish Isle of Butte was the plain Georgian mansion house of Mount Stuart. But Lord Butte had plans for that too. In a wing of Mount Stuart House, Burgess created a private chapel for his patron. Butte had been born a Church of Scotland Presbyterian, but at the age of 21, converted to Roman Catholicism. The Victorian establishment was scandalized by Butte's conversion. The Glasgow Herald newspaper fretted over Priestly influences, acting upon a weak and naturally superstitious mind. There are a number of things that might have persuaded Butte to enter the Catholic Church. He'd seen it as a boy going around Europe, and it was associated in his mind with beauty and colour and lovely churches. He liked ritual, and he always had. So those were two things that pushed him towards it. Then the Catholic Church in that period put huge emphasis on what they called the communion of saints, the idea that those whom you have loved and died, they are just standing on the other side of an invisible wall. And because Butte had lost his mother, whom he loved so dearly, 
the idea that when he went to take communion, she was there around the table with him. And that was an attraction. Tall, handsome, aristocratic, and fabulously rich, Butte was a catch. But at 23, he was still single. Rumors began to spread about the non-sporty, arty, unconventional, Catholic, and single young aristocrat. So it hurt Butte very much when it was assumed that he was impotent or that he was gay, um, because he wasn't. He'd been in love with somebody or other all of his teenage years. And when he fell in love with Gwen, she was the last love of his life. And um, he loved her to his dying day. 18-year-old Gwendolyn Mary Ann Fitzalan Howard was a granddaughter of the Duke of Norfolk, England's premier peer, and she was a Catholic. Society was agog at the marriage of the seemingly oddball Aristo. I think the rumours that spread that he hadn't managed to consummate his marriage hurt him very much indeed, and they were extraordinarily far from the truth. Um, Beauty decorated a room at Cardiff as his wife's bedroom. I shall have a bedroom fitted up with red silk for you, as that will suit your complexion. As was, of course, completely proper, he moved in there to spend his wedding night with her. The expectation of an aristocrat would be that he then moved out and left to her own bedroom. Um, but the Buttes never managed that. They continued to share a bedroom all of their lives. The couple spent part of their honeymoon at Cardiff Castle, where Team Burgess was busy completing the rooms of the clock tower. Gwen soon became fond of the eccentric architect. We have a wonderful set of correspondence from Lady Butte to her sister Angela, which shows very much the relationship that she had with Burgess. And it shows you how much Burgess was ingrained in the family. So this letter from September 1873 from Cardiff Castle to her sister Angela talks about William Burgess himself. In fact, she actually even draws this wonderful little sketch of Burgess um, with his set of binoculars here. And she writes here, this is ugly Burgess who designs lovely things. Isn't he a duck? Burgess continued to make lovely things for the Buttes at Cardiff Castle, even though the family only spent about six weeks a year there. Isn't this extraordinary? We're actually in a genuine medieval part of the castle, but of course everything you're looking at, the walls, the floor, all of the decoration, is all William Burgess, all third Marquess of Butte, all 1870s. So what are they trying to do, you ask? It's quite an odd thing to recreate a noble hall of the Middle Ages, but they're actually doing it with a degree of authenticity. So all the decoration, including this chimney piece, tells the story of the medieval history of the castle. And also we've got wonderful things like the hammer beam ceiling. There's a lot of strange decoration in here as well. We've got medieval grotesques, pigs playing bagpipes, um, things that have been copied from medieval design. Medieval style design is everywhere. If you look up into the ceiling, you'll see angels holding shields. These are all shields bearing Lord Butte's ancestors' arms. Butte was very keen on Welsh culture and he decided that he would have um, Welsh singing in here, Welsh harpists, and actually that gets taken up in some of the Welshness in the decoration. Uh, we have scenes from the Mabinogion, the um, Welsh um, fairy stories in here, and also things like the story of, of Gellert as well and Prince Llewellyn's dog. So they have tried to introduce an element of Welshness in amongst all this Scottish heraldry. Central to any house built by Butte was a library. I think this is the room in Cardiff Castle that is more personal to Butte than any other. It's, it's almost like his academic engine room. 
his interests and thoughts are revealed in the decoration. When you look at the bookcases themselves, they again reflect Butte's interests, not only in heraldry, but also in animals, the animal kingdom. All sorts of creatures, in, including tiny things like there's a stag beetle and underneath the lock plate of each of one of those uh, drawers in that bookcase. It's all part of Butte's love of the natural world. Beyond the walls of Butte's extraordinary escape from the modern world lay the bustling industrial Cardiff that his father had created. By the late 19th century, foreign sailors had settled and married into the working class community of Butte Town. Neil Sinclair is a product of Cardiff's Tiger Bay. I'm standing in front of Butte Crescent, and this is a very special uh, area because it's the earliest. In the 1830s, the second Marcus Butte, John Crichton Stewart, organized the building of the, these particular magnificent structures as a sort of pump priming for other developers to follow a suit and build buildings of equal caliber throughout the community of Tiger Bay and the docks, officially known as Butte Town. The kind of people that lived in these grand homes when it was a crescent were the sea captains, the shipping magnates, the colliery owners, etc., who would look out of their windows over to the Oval Basin. And of course, so when they saw their ships going out laden with coal, they'd wring their hands and run around the corner to Butte Street where all the new banks were being built because we were a major banking centre. And so that gives you an idea of what John Crichton Stewart had initiated when he first built Butte Crescent. Although the third Marquis didn't have his father's interest in business, he couldn't resist building an elaborate Gothic-style new head office for the Butte Dock Company. The Pierhead building remains a much-loved Cardiff landmark. It was William Frame's Gothic masterpiece in red terracotta stone, iconic building that seamen from all over the world who had settled and had families in Tiger Bay and the docks, and they recognized instantly when the ship turned the Panath head there and they saw the Pierhead building, they knew they were home and they would sail into Cardiff docks. A few miles inland from Cardiff and the commotion of the city's docks, Butte and William Burgess created another Gothic fantasy, a fairy tale castle. Castell Coch had been nothing more than a pile of ruins. The castle that you see today is the recreation of the third Marquis of Butte and William and Burgess. It looks as if it's been wafted here from the Rhine or the Loire. It doesn't look very British, it certainly doesn't look very Welsh. And what it is, is Butte's idea of recreating, in, in almost in every detail, a medieval castle. It's certainly an icon now, because when you drive to the west of Wales or you're driving back from the west, you see this extraordinary vision up on the hillside, it certainly commands attention. The Buttes only used it very, very occasionally. They would bring visitors out here. You know, part of 19th century living was um, entertaining people. So you would take people on an excursion to the ruins. Well, they could do a bit better here. You could take visitors out to Castell Cork, send lunch out, have roaring fires prepared for you, and, and take people around your castle, which must have been enormous fun. And I love Burgess's comment at the end of, of his report, where he says, inside, my lord, I ventured to indulge in a little more ornament. Well, you know exactly what that means when it comes to William Burgess. I think this has got to be one of the most romantic rooms in Wales. You can't help smiling when you come into it. Uh, although, I suppose, in a way, that the, the theme of the room is quite serious because uh, Burgess's designs 
they radiate out from a, a great fireplace or a, a ceiling. And behind me, we've got this wonderful chimney piece, which sets the theme of the room, the three Greek fates. One is spinning the thread of life, the other is measuring its length, and then the third on the end is cutting it. So it's all about the cycle of life and representing the three ages of, of man. Uh, so there's a serious theme, but when you look up into the ceiling, again, it's pure delight. That's the center of it is the sun. Radiating from the sun, we have the, the ribs, all decorated with butterflies, birds of the air, the stars, a little bit like some of the decoration and, and ceilings at Mount Stuart and, and at Cardiff Castle as well. But here there's, there's quite a bit more fun going on because as we get down to the walls, there is um, trees and plants, birds hopping about in their branches and hanging from each branch is a cord and the cord is hanging a real painting, all the members of the Butte family. There's also light-heartedness going on with, with um, scenes from Aesop's fables. Uh, so we've got the fox and the hare and so, so on and so forth. It, it's great fun. It's, it's a room with, like so many designs, with great zest and verve and, and enjoyment. And it's meant to be enjoyed. I think it's meant to put that smile on your face. Another great interior at Castell Cork. This time it's Lady Butte's bedroom. What I love about this virtually circular room is that it's a mixture of practicality and impracticality. Practicality were things like the radiator covers. So you've got central heating here, which was put in uh, right at the beginning in the 1870s. And then wonderfully impractical furniture, such as the washstand, which whilst it has hot and cold water towers, and they are literally towers, they had to be filled by hand. And the wardrobe, well, think of what the sort of clothes that Lady Beat would have worn, very large dresses. They all had to be folded and put in there. You might perhaps get one in there. But on the other hand, when you are lying in this <laughs> wildly eccentric bed uh, with glass knobs at the corners, you could look up into a wonderful ceiling and you've got uh, monkeys and uh, squirrels. They all have a particular symbolism. Uh, the squirrels are playing with pomegranates. It's a sign of fruitfulness. Perhaps it's appropriate in a double bedroom. Beneath them, we've got monkeys playing around in the foliage there. And above that, grapevines and how appropriate that is because if you looked out of the windows of this room and looked down to Cardiff, wonderful views, but directly below the castle was a vineyard, the only working commercial vineyard in Britain in the 19th century. The transformation of Castell Coch from ruin to fairy tale castle took 16 years. But William Burgess never lived to see it completed. He caught a chill while working on site and died in 1881. In the banqueting hall, a mural depicts St. Lucius, an early British king, directing his master Mason. Or are they really Butte and Burgess? Butte and Gwen returned to the Isle of Butte, where Gwen discovered she was pregnant. Her health was always fragile, and her doctor ordered her not to travel and to rest. At Mount Stuart on Christmas Eve, 1875, Gwen gave birth to a daughter, Margaret. Butte was present at the birth, not the usual place for a Victorian gentleman. I think the best picture we have of him and the tenderest is the one where he's nursing an infant child. He's got this tiny baby, which he is cradling. 
That's the only picture I know of a Victorian man holding a tiny baby. It wasn't something men did. But that's a lovely picture of him, of a nice, warm, tender person caught slightly off guard, rather than um, a Victorian aristocrat plumped down. You can't imagine anything further from a Victorian aristocrat than Butte was. In 1877, while the Buttes were away, Mount Stewart caught fire. The main building was reduced to a burnt-out shell. To any other aristocrat, it would have been a disaster. But the ever-creative Butte turned the disaster into triumph. He needed a family home, but his experience, passions, and architectural vision made what he built one of the most extraordinary Victorian buildings in the world. It was rumoured to have cost a million pounds, the first million pounds house, who knows if it was, but it was certainly the most expensive house to be built in Scotland up to that point. Mount Stewart looks medieval, but underneath it was one of the most radically modern houses in Britain. When you look into the heart of this building, it's the first purpose-built house with electricity. It's got an indoor swimming pool, the first of its kind in the world, heated. It's got an indoor heating system as well, centrally heated throughout this house. This is the most up-to-date house of its time. And when you strip away all the medieval veneer of this as well, the guts, the skeleton of this building, it's steel, it's the materials of the railway age, the industrial age, not the medieval period. So he was very much a man of his time and also a man of the future, as well as somebody that did have a great obsession with the past. Soaring to a height of 80 feet, this is the dark and mysterious heart of Mount Stewart, crowned by the constellations of the Northern Hemisphere, each star in its exact position. And then as you come down, you then see these wonderful zodiac stained glass windows. You can travel the whole course of the seasons just by following them round from spring to summer to autumn and then into those cold winter colours. And then as we come down a bit further, we'll see the figures also representing um, the signs of the zodiac that were commissioned from Carrara in Italy by Lord Bute himself. In June 1881, Gwen bore her first son, John. Two more sons followed, Ninian named after the saint who first brought Christianity to Scotland, and Colum. While he and Gwen doted on Margaret, the Butte had been desperate for a male heir. As a female, Margaret could inherit her father's Scottish estate and titles, but not the British title of Marchioness. Neither could she inherit the majority of the Butte wealth. With male heirs to spare, Butte's line and family fortune were at last secure and Mount Stuart became a playground. The hall was a place of great fun. We know the Butte children put on plays here to great entertainment. Um, for people from all walks of life across the estate were invited to those. We know that they also played badminton here. There were badminton sets kept in a chest in the hall so that the children could play when there weren't people around. This wasn't a place really to entertain the sort of bigwigs. This was a place of erudition, it was a place of fun as well, as the third Marquis's biographer once said, was it ever such a hall to play hide and seek? Bute's daughter, Margaret, didn't have the same rights of inheritance as her brothers, but her father passionately believed in women's education and gave her the best. At the time that this corridor was being created, Butte was 
educating his daughter. Formidably clever, a bit of a flibbity gibbet as regards her mind, not terribly focused. And I think what we see here is Butte trying to inspire her. Every single head in this corridor is the head of a woman. And they're a fairly mixed bunch. We have goddesses, we have heroines from mythology. And I think he is trying to inspire her. Look how many beautiful, clever, intelligent, difficult, demanding women there are in the world, all the way up here. But, I mean, it is typical of Butte that whatever he is interested in, that thing comes out in the building. The minute he gets a new enthusiasm, he can't help turning it into paint and stone and carving and colour, always colour. Nothing in any Butte building was ever done on the cheap. Wealth allowed him to be a perfectionist. But Butte's attitude to his wealth is a complex one. I think Butte had a very ambiguous relationship with his wealth. I mean, he was really, really enormously wealthy. It was, in a way, a burden to him. It set him apart from other people in a way he didn't like. But, of course, it also gave him tremendous power to do what he did like. His money weighed heavily on him. People all throughout his life talked about his riches. And that leads you to be very suspicious. Who wants you for your money uh, and who wants you for yourself? And so he had a sense of social responsibility in that he would see all the beggars who came knocking on his door. He would actually see them personally, listen to their hard luck stories, certainly when he was younger. But at the same time, he was spending enormous sums on gilded ceilings. It's quite hard to reconcile the two. Every day in his library, Butte read a pile of begging letters and judged each one on its merits. And a lot of these are from women who are destitute because they don't have a profession they can follow. Um, their husband has died, their father has died, and they have no means of earning a living. And he comes to believe that it's very important that women should be able, if they have a vocation to do these things, that they should be able to do them. When Butte became rector of St Andrews University in 1892, he designed his own inauguration robe in the medieval style. But his ambition for the ancient university was modern and progressive. He funded its first medical school, and when the university establishment tried to stop women studying there, he dug even deeper into his pockets to make sure that they could. You get the ridiculous situation where um, the professor of anatomy refuses to teach anatomy to women. So Butte puts his hand in his own back pocket and funds the first female lecturer at St Andrews University, who is a woman and who is going to teach anatomy to all comers. And I find this deeply endearing. When socialist firebrand Keir Hardy led a wave of miners' strikes in 1880, he had an unexpected ally in Lord Bute. Why did Bute fund soup kitchens for striking miners when he didn't much approve of striking? Um, for a start, Bute believed very strongly that everybody should be free to have their own opinion. And I think he would find it very difficult to think that people were starving because they had their own opinion about striking. Butte hates cruelty. Any kind of cruelty horrifies him. It absolutely horrifies him. Um, the idea that anybody could be suffering and in want and starving, it turns him up, as we would say. It just haunts his imagination and his dreams. So he certainly wouldn't want to think that miners and their children were starving. Another cause that Bute passionately embraced was Scottish independence. He was a, a conviction Scottish nationalist from the cradle. I don't think anything ever happened that challenged his view 
that Scotland should be independent. He believed it very fervently. And he gets invited in 1887, as he records in his diary for that year, to unveil the statue of William Wallace at the famous Wallace Monument in Stirling, some 20 years after the monument itself had opened. And huge crowds were there to gather to see him um, do a speech and unveil this fantastic statue of Wallace himself. It was Wallace that Bute revered as the hero of the Scottish Wars of Independence, not his own ancestor, Robert the Bruce. Bute argued that the name Wallace meant Welsh, and that William Wallace was Welsh in origin. The Stuarts belonged essentially to the conquering Norman race, not so the Wallaces. The Plantagenet conquest of Wales must have struck them with horror and indignation. They determined to resist for themselves to the uttermost of their power. It was the wealth generated by Cardiff Docks that gave Bude the freedom to be a great philanthropist and patron of the arts and architecture. But how did the city his father had created see the vastly rich, Catholic, Scottish, absentee landlord? Because they weren't the actual owners of the collieries, because they were at arm's length by simply taking their profit in the form of royalties and not in actual exploiting of the coal. And they weren't the people who were actually paying the miners. So no, there wasn't that um, interface and potential for friction that there was between the, the miners and the coal owners themselves. The Buttes were not greatly loved in, in, in some ways. My, my own family have been in Cardiff since the 1870s, since the industrial boom. And the, growing up, the one thing, or the three things, I should say, I knew about the Buttes was that they were A, rich, B, mad, and C, Catholic. And I think, uh, you know, whilst only perhaps one of those is false, uh, it, it, it's, it's true that they were not hugely popular. Absentee landlords very, very rarely are. He did have a somewhat troubled and problematic relationship with Wales up until the moment that the town council asked him to be the next mayor. And this request took him completely by surprise. They wanted him on the town council. They wanted him on the town council, not somebody else, him. Not the Marquis of Butte, but John Patrick Crichton Stewart. That role, the role of Mayor of Cardiff, gave Butte the one title that really meant something to him in his life. Now, there's a lovely story of somebody going to Cardiff Castle, knocking on the door, saying, is Lord Butte in? And the butler replies, his worship the mayor has gone to the town hall. And that delighted Butte, because for once in his life he hadn't inherited it, he'd earned it, and he was wanted for himself. One of the interesting things about the Buttes is that they were both, both second Marquis and third Marquis, very keen to encourage Welsh culture. In 1834, we had a, an Eisteddfod here at the castle, uh, and the same thing happened in the 1880s. And usually the third Marquis of Butte learned Welsh. He encouraged his children to learn Welsh. And I suppose there is an element of having come from an island on the west coast of Scotland in the 19th century. There's an element of understanding of the importance of the Welsh language. And that was pretty unusual. Butte had inherited a fortune and used it to follow his dreams. He caused great masterpieces to be built. He had a loving wife and a happy family life. He traveled widely and had an inspiring circle of friends. He supported charities, churches, universities, and the spiritual, artistic, and intellectual lives of Scotland and Wales. But he had long known that he lived with a death sentence. In 1895, Lord Butte went to the doctor with an ailment. He got some very bad news, and I think he actually records this in his diary for that year, 1895. What's very poignant about that entry is that, actually, he doesn't really say very much at all. He just does a little cross. And if you go to the back of his diary when he's reflecting on the events of the year, he basically says that the main thing in the past year is the announcement made to me by the doctor on November the 13th, and that's that entry with the cross. 
And basically, he's been told at that time that he has Bright's disease. Bright's disease, an illness of the kidneys, had killed Butte's mother and several of her family. Butte wrote to a friend. There is no use in talking about my health recovering. That is not on the cards. It is not a question. The question is what work I may manage to do within the span, which may be more or less limited, still left to me. But he also goes on to say that um, that, uh, that news gets him more interested in the Society of Psychical Research. This photograph of an alleged ghost, a man's face in the top left corner, is just one example from the Butte archive that reveals Lord Butte's fascination with second sight, psychic powers, and contacting the dead. Now, psychical research in the 19th century was very much a, a, an academic interest too, and there were very famous people that were interested in this also. William Ewart Gladstone, the Prime Minister, for example, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, or for, of course, a Sherlock Holmes, both very interested. So it wasn't no real sort of crank um, idea. And actually, why he was interested in spiritualism, um, because he you know, was obviously thinking of the afterlife and what was gonna to happen to him once he died. The scientific approach in the Victorian era had driven a coach and horses through many people's faith. And they wanted to bolster it with something. And if they could only prove that there was an unseen world there, that would bolster it. And this undoubtedly, I think, adds a real drive to his own interest in psychical research. This is the mysterious Miss X. Real name, Ada Goodrich Freer a controversial spirit medium. Lord Bute funded Miss X to lead a ghost hunt at Belechen House in Perthshire, allegedly the most haunted house in Scotland. Lord Bute paid to hire this house for a whole season, and a number of guests, including the editor of The Scotsman and others, came to stay in the house to see if they could experience some of the famous hauntings that had supposedly taken place in this particular house. And here's the book that um, both Bute and Miss X produced, uh, here kept in Lord Bute's library to this day. Bute knew that Bright's disease would cut short the thread of his life long before the allotted span of three score years and 10. In 1899, he was just 52 and dying. He faced his death with absolutely commendable courage and calm and strength of mind. This isn't a cathedral, but simply the private marble chapel that Butte commissioned at Mount Stuart shortly after he was diagnosed with his fatal illness. He never lived to see it. In 1900, he had a absolutely catastrophic stroke. And he died at the end very peacefully. And Gwen, who had loved him since she was 18, and who had not long before celebrated her silver wedding with him, was absolutely devastated. Bute was buried in a small chapel on his ancestral estate on the Isle of Bute. Bute had always been afraid of being buried alive, literally put into the ground while he was still alive. And so he had stipulated that when the doctors were completely sure he was dead, they should remove his heart from his body. And Gwen or somebody should take it to the Holy Land, where it was to be buried in plain sight of Holy Sepulchre. So Gwen commissioned this silver box, this beautiful, simple casket, and on the front of it, a crucifix and the words, thy wounds are my merits. And Butte's heart was taken from his body, mummified and put into this box. They went to the Holy Land and there within 
view of Holy Sepulchre. Butte's heart was taken out of this box and buried in the ground so that he could become part of that soil or part of him could become part of that soil. And that is the last of Butte, a very, very simple silver box that took his heart away to go where some of it had perhaps always been. The modest mausoleum on the Scottish island he loved is not the only monument to the third Marquess of Butte. His greatest bequest was to the city of Cardiff itself. I think that one of the great legacies that the Buttes have left us is the present appearance of the town. You know, people expect Cardiff because it's built on industrial wealth, expected to be blackened and, and rather overcrowded. It's not at all, it's a huge amounts of green space. There is a huge green lung in the middle of Cardiff, which is the castle grounds. The Buttes were so wealthy, of course, they didn't need to develop every last bit of their land. And effectively, 130 acres of uh, parkland adjoining the castle was back garden. The Butte obsession with Gothic style entered the architectural DNA of Cardiff's domestic buildings. Gothic arches and carved stonework are found in street after street throughout the city. Uh, the other great, I think, space we have here is the Civic Centre, which was built on Cate's Park. Now, Cate's Park had been owned by the Buttes and it was developed from the 1890s. It was sold to the corporation for the purposes of a new civic centre, so centre of civic government, education, the university is there, and so on. But there was no commercial development on there at all, and that was part of the condition of the sale. Even Cardiff street names celebrate the Butte dynasty. Butte Street itself, Mount Stuart Square after the family estate in Scotland, Column Place after Butte's third and youngest son, and the now demolished Ninian Park football ground after his second son, who became MP for Cardiff and died in World War I. The memory of the Mark, the family of the Marquis of Butte was quite strong. My mother used to tell me when I was a child, you know, the streets in our area were named after family members. And, you know, I took that for granted as a child, but as a, an adult and an archivist and an historian, I did look into it, and sure enough, they're in, the names are in the family tree. And there's the animal wall in front of Cardiff Castle. Surely Lord Butte's most surreal legacy to the city, his family created. The animal wall is a, a lovely feature of, of Cardiff. Anybody who's grown up in Cardiff always remembers as a child seeing those animals looming at you from way above your head. But I can honestly say that it's one of the best loved features of, of the city of Cardiff, all due to the Buttes. <laughs>